Our text today is Romans uh, chapter 8, a rather lengthy passage of Scripture, but a wonderful passage of Scripture, as of course all of Scripture is. Romans 8, verse 18, reading through the end of the chapter. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that would be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of him who subjected it in the hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Well, who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everybody said. As uh, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as spirit-filled believers, we have great confidence that when we pray, the Lord is able to change our circumstances. Thus we pray for healing, we pray for deliverance, we pray for miracles of God's provision. But the fact is that sometimes God chooses not to give us what we ask for. And we are often as spirit-filled believers ill-prepared to handle God's nose or God's weight. Here is a marvelous text of scripture which undergirds our faith in a time when circumstances are not dealing us a fair hand and when instead we are being asked to persevere in the midst of those. In Italy, uh, Orson Welles said, for 30 years under the Borgias, they had warfare, terror, murder, and bloodshed, but they produced Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, and the Renaissance. In Switzerland, they had brotherly love, they had 500 years of democracy and peace, and what did the Swiss produce? The cuckoo clock. So what are you producing? <laughs> Every year at the end of the Major League Baseball season, I clip out of the paper the, uh, the final results, the won and lost standings for every team in the American League and the National League. The reason uh, that I'm particularly interested in the last report of the year is it not only has the one loss record, but it, it breaks it out to the one loss record at home and the one loss record in away games. It's much harder to win on the road. And I have a theory, which has, uh, interestingly enough, been borne out over the years I've been doing this, that the teams that wind up as the division champions and into the World Series are the teams which have the best away game record. Even the bad teams sometimes, most of the time, in fact, the bad teams have a, have a have win more games at home than they lose, but the great teams win on the road. 
And the fact of the matter is that the Christian life is a one long road game. And Paul, in this marvelous text of scripture, uses words that may be uh, offensive to some Christian ears today who are into uh, denying uh, these, uh, the reality of these words, but Paul the Apostle uses them. Words like suffering, frustration, verse 20, groaning twice, verse 22, 23, weakness, trouble, and hardship. Why uh, do we have these things? Why do we suffer? Well, we're linked to two people that are the our reasons for our suffering. First, we're linked to Adam. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sin. It's because of Adam that we get death. Not just the act of death, but the whole process of getting there. Which at this point in my life is late middle age, falling out here, teeth in trouble, and arches falling. <laughs> death. The whole process of unintended consequences, the, the non-suspension by God of the law of cause and effect, which allow drunk drivers to, ply, to plow into innocent people, all, 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 of that, all of that wacky and weird and problematic and accidental and, and illness stuff that happens in life stems out of our linkage with Adam. But the New Testament goes on to tell us also that some of our suffering is linked directly to Jesus. 2 Timothy verse 3 to 12, verse 3, uh, ver chapter 3, verse 12. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now the persecution may take more subtle forms, such as a decision in your own personal life, in your own professional life, in your own business, to do things ethically and morally at a considerable cost, perhaps even promotion, perhaps even advancement. Of, uh, or, or financial blessing, whatever. In, uh, in most countries of the world today, outside the United States, there is a greater cost to following Christ than we American Christians bear. Perhaps we will bear more costs as the time comes. We're already being pilloried and persecuted uh, in, the, in the mainstream America today as uh, bigoted, uh, pointy-headed uh, people. And some of that we visit on ourselves by always lecturing the world on how they ought to behave. We ought to instead be demonstrating through deeds of compassion the mercy and the kindness of Christ that would do more than anything in this world to, to help us bear witness for Jesus than a thousand lectures to the culture. That was not in my sermon notes, but I felt anointed to say that, Pastor. <laughs> we often, when we are going through hard times in our life, ask why? The New Testament forever is looking away from the why question to the what question. What do I do now? And these, these words from Paul in Romans chapter 8 give us four great encouragements. First encouragement, and this may not seem like much of an encouragement to you. You have to have the long view to have this encouragement. It is this, compare the coming glory to the present groaning, verses 18 through 25. Paul is saying in this, in this paragraph, don't focus exclusively on the present. Uh, you need to look ahead. Put the present groaning on one side of the scale. Imagine the future glory on the other side of the scale. And when the two are weighed against one another, it will become apparent in that day that the future glory far outweighs the present groaning. And so knowing that the future glory is coming helps us to not divorce the present groaning from what God has in store for those who love him. Of course, the coming glory of this world is, uh, the coming glory in this passage is not a this world glory. Paul says the whole created order is groaning as in the pains of childbirth. Uh, it's waiting for the liberation of the children of God. Boy, you could... You could spend a long time just meditating on that, and I'll fly right by that. But uh, the intriguing thing about the groaning here is that it's the groaning related to childbirth, not the groaning related to death. I have, I have been blessed by God to have a gender that disqualifies me from childbirth. <laughs> but the pain of childbirth is not because... 
dying is coming, the pain of childbirth is because life is coming and birth is coming. And Paul says we must conceive of groaning in that kind of context. Nature is groaning and even, he says, we are groaning. We are not charismatic Christian scientists who deny pain and deny evil and pretend everything is well when it's not. We also are groaning. In our attempts to make the gospel relevant to culture and teach people how to live a better life, we have almost let glory, i.e. heaven, become a neglected doctrine. And if you live in Orange County, why do you need heaven? But even with the Spirit, Paul says, we are groaning. If we took the time to go across this room this morning and you could honestly and transparently tell what is in your heart and the pain you carry and the burden you bear or the suffering you endure, some of it very private, some of it very relational, others of you physical, others of you financially, there would, where would not be a dry eye in this house. When we're in assembly such as this, we're also fine and dressed well and we're at our best. But God knows the hurt and the heartache. And the Spirit is with us in our groaning. Paul just says, remember what follows the groan, not death but birth. I, uh, when I was pastor, often at a memorial service for one of our church members, at some point in the service, I would pull out something like this and I would say, see this? And I would refer to 1 Corinthians 15 about the body is sown in dishonor, but raised in honor. And this actually is a very ugly, gnarly bulb. And you could never guess by looking at it what is coming. But what is coming in the springtime is this glorious color cardinal tulip. The package tells us what the bulb is going to be. And the gospel of Jesus Christ says to us that our whole lives, which are, in, which are tending toward death and tending toward the grave, they are going to be laid in dishonor, laid in corruption, are going to be raised immortal, incorruptible, and with honor. And when we look at the resurrected Jesus Christ, we've already got the photograph of what we will yet be. The hymn writer had it well when he said, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. C.S. Lewis eloquently said, hope means a continual looking forward to the next world. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world thought most about the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they are inefficient in this one. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Are you living a life that is this world only? Do you realize that the span of this life is but a sliver compared to the span God has for eternity? Paul says, never, never isolate from your thoughts or X out of your thinking the future glory. Even if you are not in a moment in life when you are groaning, maybe everything is just great in your life right now. Wonderful, keep it that way. But however great it is, it is still minuscule compared to what God has in store for us. Second, Paul says, the second great encouragement is the Holy Spirit is helping us. Verses 26 and 27. He says, uh, we don't know how to pray what we ought to pray for. The Spirit is helping us in our weakness. That's why we need His help. It's very interesting to use, to look at the use of the word know, K-N-O-W, in the Romans 8 passage. He says, we know the whole creation is groaning, verse 18. He says in verse 28, we know God is working good in all things. And then in verse 26, he says, we don't know. We don't know. We don't know what to pray for. I love the, I love the honesty of that. I, 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 I think that sometimes uh, as believers we, we try too hard to fake it in our faith and provide quick answers for every dilemma when there are moments when we just have to look at, at what is happening and say, I don't have a clue. I don't know what God's up to. I don't even know how to pray through this situation. I have prayed every prayer I know how, and nothing has yielded. 
So Paul says, we don't know what to pray for. Now, he doesn't mean he doesn't know how to pray the Lord's Prayer or the High Priestly Prayer of John 17 or it's Ephesians 1 and Ephesians 3. Prayer show us he does know how to pray in terms of form and content. But the we know not applies to situations where we are groaning and we don't know how it's going to turn out. But the Spirit knows. The Spirit who searches our hearts knows the mind of God. We therefore in this Romans 8 passage are told that we have two intercessors, the Holy Spirit in the heart and Christ in the heavens who always lives to make intercession for us. The Spirit is praying through us, for us, in our weakness. With groans sometimes it can't be uttered, words that cannot be expressed. Paul could here be referring to a prayer language of speaking in other tongues. He could be referring just to a hard sigh and a deep groan. He's saying in that inarticulate moment, the Holy Spirit is praying through, when, through the moments you cannot even articulate the pain that you feel. I, uh, my beautiful daughter Evangeline is in the service today and her husband Rick and grandchildren. I remember when Evangeline was just a three-year-old and was sleeping in her bed one night. This night particularly stands out. It was kind of a transcendental moment for me. It's anchored, anchored me uh, a lot through my life, reflected on that moment a lot. And, I'm standing in her doorway watching her. She was such a cute baby. She has such a cute baby now, little Jacob. And uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm watching Evangeline. She's, uh, I think, about three. She could have been two. Somewhere in that wonderful age, just sound asleep. I'm standing at her doorway. And I just, I just have uh, felt the Holy Spirit just had me pray for her in those moments. And as I was praying for her and for her life, I thought of... Um, I thought, in fact, she's not even aware at this moment that I'm praying for her. But that's okay. She doesn't need to be aware. And it was like the Lord said to me, and you don't know, George, how many times I have prayed for you when you have been sleeping and you haven't been aware of it. But simply because you're not aware of it doesn't mean I haven't been praying for you. Hudson Taylor, the founder of the China Inland Mission, once said, it doesn't really matter how great the pressure is, it only matters where the pressure lies. See that the pressure never comes between you and the Lord, then the greater the pressure, the more it will press you to his breast. Third, great encouragement. God is working for the good. Romans 8, verses 28 and 29. We know, Paul says, God is working for the good. I'll never forget, in this pulpit about 15 or so years ago, one of our missionary families standing who had just come off an experience in the South Pacific Island where their whole family had been brutalized by four thugs and had suffered unspeakable uh, 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 emotional, uh, physical, uh, psychological injury. And uh, they were in the process of a recovery which has, uh, which has today, of course, uh, put them on a complete course of wholeness and they are well. But in those, in that early, uh, in those early months, uh, they were struggling a lot with the feelings of the, the tremendous ravishing that had occurred in their life of the enemy. And that missionary that day said, uh, said, we learned in this experience to distinguish our feelings from our knowings. Our feelings tell us that God is not working for the good. But the scripture says, we know, not we feel, we know. And of course, we know that. I, I always have to go back in my own life to the ground of being. I must tell you very flat, I'm able to take the scripture at its word because, because Jesus is risen from the dead. And when, you've, when you have the Lord, the crucified Lord, risen from the dead on the third day, then you have a ground of reliability for everything the scripture says. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's just all puffery. It's kind of nice idea, but you could, you could pick up the latest guru or self-help book and get the same kind of stuff that would give you a little uh, uh, placebo for the pain. But Jesus is risen. And on the basis of his resurrection, we have authority to say what we're saying, that just as crucifixion was not God's final word and God was working good in the crucifixion of Jesus, so God is working for the good in your life and in mine. The Lord knows sometimes I'm not working for the good and other people are not working for the good and circumstances don't seem to be working for the good, but I've always got someone in my corner who's working for the good. 
Notice the comprehensiveness of the working, all, all things, not just some things, all. That's kind of hard to swallow when the one thing you're thinking of is the thing you wish that would push out of your life. I love the story that Wayne Crace uh, tells about the time when he was a pioneer pastor, a young pastor in Wheaton, Illinois. He was still in his 20s. I think he had hair then too. And he called on the uh, elderly lady who was sick. Her husband was there. And he knelt at her bed and prayed for her, fully expecting that God would raise her up as a result of his faith-believing prayer. And when he opened his eyes and she was still sick, it really bothered him. And she, the old saint could see that at the troubled look on her young pastor's face. And so she just said in her, in her thick German brogue, well, pastor, she said, this must be one of the all things. And he said, uh, what do you mean? And she said, well, when I was a little girl in Germany one day, I asked my mother, what does the Bible verse mean? God is working for the good in all things. And my mother didn't answer me. She had been baking a cake in the kitchen. And what she did is she just took a tablespoon, dipped it into the baking soda and, and, and said, here, Amelia, taste this. She said, I put the spoon in my mouth and tasted the baking soda. She said, it tasted awful and I spit it out. And uh, she said, uh, I asked the mother, what are you doing? And she said to me, I'm answering your question. Uh, after a couple hours went by and the cake came out of the oven, Amelia sits down, her mother gives her the cake. She tastes it and starts eating it. And her mother says, well, Amelia, how do you like that cake? She said, oh, it's a very good cake. I love your cake, mother. She said, well, you know that cake has baking soda in it, what you spat out. She said, I don't want you to ever forget, Amelia, that things taken by themselves are not always pleasant. But when they are mixed together and fired in the oven, you will love the results. That's the all things work together, the comprehensiveness. The goal of the working, secondly, is for good. It does not say everything that happens to us is good because a lot of stuff that happens to us is plain yucky. I hate it. It's, it's, uh, it's the goal is for good. Even the bad things can work for a good purpose. Jesus, for example, did not say, oh, I thank you, God, for the blessing of Lazarus being dead. Oh, it's just so wonderful he's dead. What a good thing that he's dead and I'm standing here. I praise you he's dead. Oh, he doesn't ever, doesn't ever do anything like that. He's, he instead finds what is true, to, true and good to give thanks for. He says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And, and in that hearing, he is going to work for the good. Theodore Steinway, who founded the piano company Steinway & Sons, said, in one of our concert grand pianos, 243 taut strings exert a pull of 40,000 pounds on an iron frame. It's proof that out of great tension can come great harmony. <laughs> Several weeks ago, I called Chamber of Commerce in Enterprise, Alabama, because I had told this story in varying forms and heard it in varying forms. I decided, finally, I better get it straight. Enterprise, Alabama, in 1915, lost 60% of its cotton crop to the bull weevil. It uh, had even greater destruction in 1916. It forced the farmers in Coffee County into diversified farming. And in 1917, they began planting peanuts and other crops. By the time two more years had gone by, they had become so prosperous that they unveiled in the, in the main street, the main square of Enterprise, Alabama, a statue that no one else in the world has. It's 10 foot tall, and it's a symbol to man's ability to adjust to adversity. It is a 10 foot stall, fall, 10 foot tall statue of the bull weevil. <laughs> and, and this is what the Chamber of Commerce told me is on the plaque at the base of the statue. In profound appreciation of the bull weevil and what it has done as the herald of prosperity, this monument was erected by the citizens of Enterprise, Coffee County, Alabama. For 80 years in Enterprise, Alabama, they have had a plaque to their plague. I like that. The goal of the working is for good. I was reading a story about, in fact, I was at, uh, at Yellowstone and overlooked an area where there was a plaque that said, five years after devastating wildfires burned about 1.2 million acres in the greater Yellowstone area, researchers are finding long-term beneficial effects, including a vigorous recovery of most plants and steady or growing population of large mammals. The forest is going to be reestablished. In many cases, the seedling density is greater than the original stand density. In many burned over areas where mature lodgepole pines once
once stood, the number of established seedlings is eight times as large as the original number of trees. And then came a line which explains why the forest is more prolific today than it ever was before the fire. And I highlighted this line. Many lodgepole seeds require fire to open. Maybe last year or last month or last week or yesterday, a fire blazed in your life and burned up a lot of things you had gotten used to. But consider the density of the new growth the Lord wants to bring into your life and ministry. Perhaps your experience will be like the lodgepole seeds. Only the fire could have opened the new potential God has for you. The goal of the working for good. The limitation of the working, twofold manward, You've got to love God to those who love God and the Godward limitation to those who are called. The idea of calling there is effective calling. It's different than when I was a boy and was out and my mother would say, Georgie, that was her name for me, it's dinner time, Georgie, and I would just keep doing what I was doing. But when dad came to the door and said, George, that was an effective call. Perhaps you've, you're here and the soft voice of the Holy Spirit has been calling you and you just keep doing your own thing. God wants to get your attention because he wants to call you. Effective calling is one where we respond. And Paul puts this in terms that really stagger our ability to deal with the text. And he, he says you're effectively called because he foreknew you and he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. He called you, justified you, and you glorified you. Those are all elements of the call. Now, what's really intriguing, if you want to do the fine skullduggery on this text, is that the words are all in the past tense, including the word glorified, which hasn't yet happened. We have not yet been glorified because our body has not yet received the, the benefits of the resurrection. But Paul says, so effective is God's call that your future glorification, I'm already going to say, is happened. The fourth great encouragement is God is for us. Verses 31 through 39. Who is against us? Sin is against us. Satan, death, hell. Sometimes circumstances, sometimes people we've had relationships with, but never God. Paul argues from the greater to the lesser. He says, if God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, will he not also give us all things? Who therefore will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Who will condemn? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? He gives seven adversities which can separate trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword. He gives six polarities that can separate death, life, angels, demons, present, future, powers, height, depth, anything else in all God's creation. And then he says, no, that, none of that's going to separate us. There are times when you may feel everything is against you, but there is always one who is for you, Jesus Christ our Lord. At Christmas season, I had the chance to go up to Seal Beach where my son is associate pastor, and he was preaching. He's a marvelous preacher. And uh, he, was, he was speaking on the prodigal son. And he said something which uh, I knew but really had not put in quite that crisp a term. He said, he said, the most common picture people have of God in our culture is God as a policeman who is looking to see what you've done wrong and nail you for it. But the God who, who, is, who is represented by Jesus in that central parable of God's love, the father of the prodigal son, God is not the policeman looking for an errant son who has been misbehaving. He is the God who looks and looks and looks, hoping that the son will come to himself and come to his father. God loves us and is for us. Because of that, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. The word for conqueror there is an, a more than conqueror is an interesting word in the Greek text. It's one word, more than conqueror is one word. It's the word hyper nikomen. You may recognize those words. Hyper, do you have a hyperactive child? Do you have hypersensitive personality? Hyper is an, a, an attenuation. It's, it's, a, it's, it's more than normal. Hyper, he's hyper. So we got hyper in here. And then we got the word Nikomen. Do you recognize that word at all? Nike. 
conqueror. Paul says in the Christian life, because God is for us, we're not just winners. We don't just barely break the tape an eighth of an inch ahead of the next person coming down the lane, but instead we win by a mile. We are incredibly, an incredible term, especially when you're depressed and think everything is against you. God is saying, no, 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 no. You are a hyper Nike. <laughs> I am convinced. Not that circumstances will change, Paul says. I'm not convinced of that at all. Circumstances may get worse. But I am convinced that nothing will or can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Ruth Harms Calkins puts it this way, and I close with her wonderful paraphrase of this text. God, I may fall flat on my face. I may fail until I feel old and beaten and done in. Yet your love for me is changeless. All the music may go out of my life. My private world may shatter to dust. Even so, you will hold me in the palm of your steady hand. No turn in the affairs of my fractured life can baffle you. Satan, with all of his braggadocia, cannot distract you. Nothing can separate me from your measureless love. Pain can't. Disappointment can't. Anguish can't. Yesterday, today, tomorrow can't. Life can't. Riots, war, insanity, unidentity, hunger, neurosis, disease, none of these things, nor all of them heaped together, can budge the fact that I am dearly loved completely forgiven and forever free through Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. And may these words and this scripture be a powerful instrument in our lives to be of good cheer, for you have overcome the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.